You look for stem cells, you can double the number of stem cells in your body by just drinking dark cocoa, 80% or higher, for 30 days. And, and, and then you double the about the body's ability to healthier blood vessels because they so VEGF is a great thing until it's a bad thing and it can be a bad thing in some diseases like cancer those mutations that our body can't repair enough is which is why we want to eat foods that can help to help our body protect um, uh, the good blood vessels and not the bad ones when cancers actually um, start without uh, without a blood supply because of mutations, um, they they can't grow bigger than the head of a ballpoint pen. Let me see if I can see a ballpoint pen around here. I actually show just how big it is. Well, this isn't really a ballpoint pen, but you can kind of see this is a pen. That little tip there, that little nub, that's it. That's how big a cancer can get without oxygen. But a few of these cancer cells can figure out how to hijack our vascular system and selfishly grow blood vessels to it, right? It's like a bank robber going in there to bust out some cash. Well, how does it, how does a cancer do this? It copy pastes VEGF. It learns how to actually make the healing factor. And instead of healing, it drops some of that good stuff to wake up the vascular endothelial cells, the blood vessels, and the vessels are tricked into feeding the cancer instead. And the moment that blood vessels touch that little nub that couldn't grow without a blood supply, we've done research to show once angiogenesis or blood vessels touch a tumor, a, a tiny little tumor can grow 16,000 times in size in two weeks. So this is the trigger for tumor growth. Without angiogenesis, without VEGF, tumors are essentially harmless. Mm, oh my goodness, this is fascinating. The body is so amazing and there's so many different things going on. So not only is your body repairing, spell checking DNA mistakes and doing processes to, you know, prevent angiogenesis to cancer cells, for example, and, you know, defending your body against novel viruses and the list goes on and on. Um, it's all of these multifaceted roles, but in this role specifically, I would imagine that somebody with the with the severe COVID infection, for example, that their veg F would probably shooting up pretty high would be kind of another indicator that something's going on. What do you think about that? Well, that's a great question. I, I'm not aware yet that we've actually studied levels, circulating levels of veg F in people with COVID. And in fact, you've actually sparked a new research idea because we should be doing this, Sean. We will document on your podcast, this is where this idea began. And we'll have to acknowledge it if it turns out into a research, anything positive out of the research study. But I will tell you, um, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're still grappling with acute COVID infection, obviously. We're trying to get vaccinated so we can prevent um, getting the COVID. But the other problem that's occurring is long COVID or people who have you know, gotten the infection and they seem like they've gotten, their lungs have gotten better, but then months later, they wind up having all these same bizarre things all over again. Um, uh, head brain fog and smelling problems and racing heart, uh, all kinds of muscle skeletal weaknesses. And, and, you know, we know that there's chronic inflammation. We know there's vascular damage. I've been studying that. And I'm wondering maybe a biomarker for the damage actually would be high levels of circulating veg because inflammation not only cancer but inflammation also triggers VEGF to come out because usually and you know, think about it I, we started talking about VEGF as a good guy it is you needed to build all the muscles you needed to build your heart you needed to keep your circulation good um, but in the case of disease the body responds and sometimes gets tricked and inflammation can cause a lot of VEGF to go out, which can also, um, you know, cause chaos. Good idea. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, you know what? I, I just thought of something else because in speaking about folks who come down with a severe case of this and then they're, you know, they recover and they're kind of trying to battle back. I know there's so many different things that people just aren't aware of that can assist in that. Because again, it's, we're talking about healing vessels, blood vessels. We're talking about healing capillaries. We're, this is where the real uh, kind of mess is taking place and the body's trying to fix. What do you think about something like hyperbaric oxygen, for example, to, to aid in that? You know, I, I, I've been thinking about this because I, I'm working with multiple groups now trying to figure out how to um, help people who have 
um, uh, survive COVID, but they're really struggling. And in some of the work I've done, uh, we've been able to document uh, literally people who are six, nine months out of COVID, they're missing blood vessels, sometimes up to 50 or even 80% of their microcirculation, those tiny little blood vessels in their lungs are missing, probably damaged by the, by the virus itself. And how do you grow them back? Well, uh, one of the things I've been thinking about is we need to heal up that injury caused by the virus, by COVID. And one of the things that we might be able to tear a page from the playbook of is wound healing. So hyperbaric oxygen is one of the tools that we use to be able to help people with chronic wounds that are not healing fast enough and they're at risk to really prompt them to stimulate new blood vessel growth. And guess what hyperbaric does? Hyperbaric oxygen um, stimulates VEGF. It stimulates the superhero growth factor, the protein that grows new blood vessels. So I'm going to score two for you because that's another <clears throat> way that might correlate with that um, that growth factor as a biomarker uh, in people who are actually trying to recover from long COVID if we actually get hyperbaric on them. When you put me in the study references, make sure to put that handsome guy for the Model Health Show, Sean Stevenson. Uh, well, listen, I think you should be a co-author on it. I'll make you Absolutely. read the manuscript. Absolutely. <laughs> So now I think it's a good point for us to dive in and share some of the things that you shared with me that was just like so eye-opening and refreshing. But proactively, what can we do? Because for me, and you, you know this about me as well, and you know everybody listening, one of my fundamental principles, one of the big tenets that I'm trying to integrate into our culture is the fact that our bodies are literally made from the food that we eat and also the ability to run processes. It's all dependent upon food. When we're talking about blood vessels, they're made from food. They're made from your food, the things you're consuming with you know, water, the oxygen you're breathing. It's creating the cells themselves. This stuff matters so much, and it hasn't been a big part of the conversation. And we can just add some things in here, some health defense systems to be more on the offense. you know. And so you shared some things with me as far as food that was just so powerful and let's talk about some of those right now. What are some of the foods that we can be targeting and eating and integrating to really to help us to build up some more resistance and resilience during this time right now? Well, listen, I mean, uh, I think that if our body's health defenses are strong, that old adage of the best offense is a strong defense is really the lead that we should be all thinking about every single one of us, whether you get the vaccine or not, whether you've had COVID or not, whether you're just, you know, kind of going about your way, doesn't matter your belief system. You got to believe in yourself, regardless of your philosophy. Your body can never lie to you, which means that when you're actually, your body's not, when you don't believe in your body, by the way, like ultimately the biggest religion that we can have, all of us, is really believing in ourselves and what we're actually made out of. And so that core, our cellular integrity and our ability to be able to defend it is in fact, you know, what you were, I think you were talking about. So what are some of the things that we can do, uh, pandemic or not, but especially during a pandemic that we can actually fortify our defenses? I'm going to come to the, to the immune system at the very end, but because we were just talking about some of the damage that can occur when you get COVID in the lung and damaging blood vessels, or even in long COVID, by the way, People with uh, who have survived COVID but having these damages, they call themselves long haulers, like truckers that are driving across the country. Man, you know, after 48 hours, still driving, still having this, still having this problem with COVID. Um, that's what they call themselves. Long COVID is what the British were calling this because they, you know, English people like to put t uh, uh, nice titles on things as much as possible. But the NIH recently created an official scientific and medical title for it. They call it PASC or PASC. Now, um, and that stands for post-acute, meaning after you've already had um, sequelae, meaning consequences of what you had to deal with afterwards, um, uh, COVID-19. So post-acute sequelae of COVID, PASC, is basically what some of these people are having. And because I told you we just had vascular damage, let's start with what we can do to protect our blood vessels, right? Good circulation, you know, probably more resistant to virus infection, but definitely if it's been damaged, you want to be able to heal that baby up. 
So what are the things that can actually help us have a better health, uh, vascular uh, health defense system? You know, um, we know that fruits and vegetables are actually healthy for us. And by the way, I don't know if you saw this, uh, recently there was a major um, study that came out, uh, looked at 2 million people and showed that exactly how many servings of fruits and vegetables you should have for optimal health. Turns out to be two servings of fruits per day and three servings of vegetables a day um, is actually what they just studied real world people and figured out that actually seems to optimize health. So what are what are some things about fruits? You know, because I, I actually really like fruits. Um, it turns out that there is a natural substance called ursolic acid. And ursolic acid tends to be found in fruit peel, fruit skin. So when I in the fall, when I actually eat fruit, um, uh, I, I love to eat the skin. It's got a lot of fiber in it, you know, extra nutrient, micronutrients. Um, and by the way, this is this would be the kind of the situation where I would tell people, if you're going to have the fruit skin, you probably want to have organic or organic like grown because you don't want to have that pesticides on it. You can't scrub that off very easily. But ursolic acid actually stimulates. Guess what? VEGF in your body to help grow blood vessels. So, you know, this is like a whole story we're telling in, in, in this podcast. Like every point actually connects to another point. And that's really what health is all about. Fruit skins. Now, listen, you want to eat some fruit skins. You can eat a whole apple and you can get a, you know, a fair amount of fruit skin. Um, but here's a, I'll give you, I'll give you uh, your, your, your viewers and listeners a super simple tip of how to eat a lot of fruit skin. Um, create a trail mix with good, healthy nuts, but have dried fruits in it dried cherries, um, uh, dried cranberries, dried blueberries, dried apricots. That's a way of shrinking down a pretty big mass of fruit into tiny little things. You can just pop, you can throw that down the hatch and get a lot of that fruit skin. So that would be one example of how we can do it. Barley is another example of a food that actually, you know, has this bioactive in it that actually stimulates angiogenesis. And mushrooms also have beta D glucan that can also help groom our vascular endothelium, those cells around our blood vessels to keep it healthy. Oh, that's perfect. So this is addressing one particular area and it's incredibly insightful. And my son, Jordan, uh, you know, he's a personal trainer now. He's creating his own programs, helping people, working with kids. It's amazing. One of the things that he's always doing on social media is showing people the unique ways that you can eat fruit. So he's like eating the key, the whole kiwi, you know, which you would think just to peel off that kind of fuzzy skin. But, you know, this is another thing that you could take advantage of. Yeah, that's right. There's all kinds of little tips. You know, one of the things I love about food. So I always tell people I'm not one of these doctors that rejects modern medicine. Uh, and, and, I, and I somehow... Got on the on the veggie craze, so I wail, I stand up on a podium and wave wave a kale leaf. I'm not one of those guys. Actually, I helped to develop biotech drugs, so I'm a big believer in the right medicine for the right person at the right time. Um, that's important, but the missing tool in the toolbox is our diet and our food. When it comes to food, I tell people I actually love food. I don't. I wouldn't say I love eating. Like I'm not. You know, I don't love stuff in my face, but I love food. I love food. Sean, because it tells us something. Everybody's got a connection to food. It's intimate. Food tells us something about our upbringing, how we grew up, what we remember, our earliest memories with our families, our moms, you know, our kitchens we grew up in, the smells when we were when we were coming back from school. It tells us something about our families, our communities, our culture. And so everybody has this very complicated, very personal, intimate connection with food. And that's a great thing about it is that you can always find, explore something new about how to eat foods. And if you're someone who's like me, curious about cultures, you know, um, you can go out and explore new cultures. It's like, you know, and in today's digital world, you can pick up a food that you don't know much about. Like I'll give you one, bitter melon. The heck is a bitter melon? Well, it's a Southeast Asian. It's kind of like a cucumber. It's a little hairy. It's got grooves in it. Um, and if you were to eat it and taste it like, and you don't know how to prepare it, man, is that thing bitter. But if you want to actually skin it, seed it, chop it up, um, put it in some vegetable stock, slowly simmer it to soften up the melon, okay, and then cook it with some fish or some chicken and that animal protein complements the bitterness and cooking it mellows the whole thing out, guess what that turn, turns out to do? 
it actually stimulates your stem cells, protects your DNA, and boosts your immunity at the same time. And guess what? Bitter melon has always been a traditional medicinal food in Southeast Asia. Like, man, I love that kind of stuff. And you can today, you can go on YouTube and search bitter melon recipe, and you can watch somebody cook it for you. Ah, uh, so good. Yeah, I haven't thought about bitter melon, bitter, bitter melon in quite some time. You know, that's one of those foods that also has some benefit with insulin resistance, for example. Exactly. You know, that's the thing too, is like, it's typically not just one thing that a food is good for because your body is not compartmentalized. It's good for, if it's good for one thing, it's probably good for a lot of other things. You said something to me the other day when we were talking about broccoli sprouts that really tripped me out. Can you share that? Yeah, well, so another immune system, uh, defense system uh, that we want to boost these times is our immune system. And uh, um, so... One of the first things I did at the beginning of the pandemic was go back to my playbook to say, okay, so what can actually um, uh, uh, amplify, amp up um, that front line of defense, right? We're talking about those sentries, that passport control that can prevent viruses from coming in. Well, you know, here's what I did. I figured out, well, we didn't have a vaccine at the time, but I wanted to know what actually can naturally kind of not vaccinate yourself, but to up those, or ramp up those natural defenses. And it turns out that sulforaphanes, which are a class of chemical that tastes a little sulfury, by the way, that's what kale, broccoli, cauliflower, they've got a lot of that sulfury um, kind of a, a, a little taste to it, actually. It's kind of the, it's kind of the part of the palate, let's say, a palate stimulator. Um, that broccoli, actually adult broccoli, you know, the treetops and the, and the trunks, they have a lot of it. And I thought, you know, that's really cool because I had done research looking at the biological properties of broccoli. And, and we tested the, the treetops versus the, the stems. And we found the treetops are very active. We found that there was twice as much activity in the stem. So I thought, well, okay, well, let's, maybe I should be eating some broccoli stem. But then I started to take a look further. And I was blown away by something, Sean, which is that as much as broccoli stems have of these sulforaphanes, th those are grown-up broccolis, that baby broccolis, broccoli sprouts, we're talking about three to four-day-old broccoli. You can see them in the markets now, like just a regular supermarket. If you go to the sprout section, I remember they used to have just only like bean sprouts. Now they got all kinds of sprouts, you know, alfalfa, broccoli. The broccoli sprouts are just growing up. They're three to four days old. You buy them up, and you got to kind of peel them apart. They're, they're kind of like like it's like long, it's like turf, like astroturf a little bit. Peel them apart, wash them up, and you eat them. They're, they they don't taste like broccoli actually. They taste nutty, which I love. I love a little kind of nutty flavor. It's unexpected, honestly. And you can sprinkle on almost any food that you're actually preparing, and it, it, it makes it taste a little bit better. But here's the crazy thing: the sulfur, the sulforaphanes that are in adult broccoli. The baby ones have 100 times the concentration. It's almost like the broccoli was born with all the sulforaphanes it's ever going to have. All right. And then and a little tiny little sprout. And as it grows up and extends in terms of this gigantic thing, right? Think Jolly Green Giant, right? It's a big. It, dis it distributes all the broccoli, the sulforaphanes that started in the, in the entire body of the broccoli. So broccoli sprouts have a lot of sulforaphanes. And then here's the here's really the kind of the the punchline. Turns out research has been done showing that if you drink a shake made out of broccoli sprouts, a couple of shakes actually a day, and just a cup of broccoli sprouts put into a shake, um, and then you get actually a flu vaccine. So this isn't COVID. This is just regular old, you know, garden variety flu vaccine, which everybody should get. Um, and and you also drink the broccoli sprout shake. You will, the shake, the broccoli spots will amplify, amp up your body's response to a vaccine 22 times. So you wind up going kind of like ordinary vaccine responder to super soldier yourself. You just like really amp your defenses. And when they actually studied in these people, these are, these are young people, healthy people, um, uh, their T cells and, and natural killer cells, they were amped up beyond 
and more more defense cells, immune cells, and more killing power within each of those cells against the virus. And then when they actually swab to look for viruses, right? Um, so, you know, like everybody was like, oh, my God, not the COVID swab in your nose. But when you do research, you actually do swabs to just look for influenza, just a regular flu virus. We don't have to go deep, just go even in a regular nose. Uh, people who are on a placebo drink, so this is a placebo-controlled study, um, still had flu vaccine, flu virus in their nose, but in the broccoli drinkers, shake drinkers who got the vaccine, zero, Z. And so this is sort of like the proof of concept of just how powerful Mother Nature is, and our body can respond to it in equally powerful ways. Incredible, incredible. All right, I know we're getting tight on time here, but I would love if you could share with these health defense systems, There's again, there's five that we need to target, and there's a lot more that you can learn from Dr. Lee, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But if there's maybe one or two more foods that we need to target right now to help with our body's defense systems. Yeah, well, look, I mean, let, let's let's go through five, okay? So androgenesis, um, uh, we, we talked about fruit peel to help endothelial cells stay healthy. Uh, immune system, we talked about broccoli sprouts. Let's talk about regeneration, stem cells. It turns out that cacao, dark chocolate, the stuff, not the sweet stuff, the stuff that's actually kind of slightly bitter, comes from Mother Nature, comes from a pod, actually can double the number of stem cells in your bloodstream if you have the equivalent of dark chocolate, like 80% or higher. So it's pretty bitter. I, I actually like it. Um, and, you, and you have it as hot chocolate twice a day. Research has shown you can take people with cardiovascular disease, impaired blood flow, and you can drink that and it'll mobilize your stem cells. You can actually measure it with a blood test, right? Like the kind of blood test you go to your doctor's office. Instead of looking for the usual uh, suspects in a blood test you get, you look for stem cells, you can double the number of stem cells in your body by just drinking dark cocoa, 80% or higher, for 30 days. And, and, and then you double the about body's ability to healthier blood vessels because they've been repaired, regenerated. That's stem cells, all right? Now, that did that for your blood vessels. Think about what it did for your brain. Think about what it did for your heart. Think about it with your kidney, your liver, and by the way, your skin and your hair and all that other kind of stuff, important. So that's uh, the, the third defense system. Let's talk about microbiome, uh, something that people might not um, uh, have expected because, all right, look, I mean, you, you know, if I were to meet expectations, what am I going to say about the microbiome? Have some fermented foods. Go ahead and have some yogurt, sauerkraut, kimchi, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely do that. But what about kiwi? What have I told you? Because you talked about kiwi earlier. It made me think about it. Now, what have I told you that having... Now, kiwi is a great source of vitamin C, which is good for your immunity um, and lowering inflammation, but it's got a lot of fiber in it and a surprising amount of fiber in just the green stuff. I'm, the, if you eat the skin, it's got a ton of fiber, but just the green stuff actually has a lot of fiber. Um, you can taste it when you're eating a kiwi. If you actually chew it, you can, you, can, you can taste the fiber, although it kind of goes down really easily. Turns out eating just one kiwi a day will quickly start to change the number of healthy gut bacteria in your body. And, uh, and it only takes like 24 hours to cause that benefit. And so this is a quick, I wouldn't call it a fix, but it is a quick way of getting your gut to actually repair itself. And so um, microbiome, kiwi. Now let's go for DNA repair, because I, you know, I, I, I love the idea of DNA um, of fixing your DNA, your like own gene therapy. Here's uh, something that most people will take them like by surprise. There's a lot of things, you know, like antioxidants, do all that kind of stuff. What if I told you that sunflower seeds can actually slow down the degradation of your telomeres? So these are the life fuse, that thing that protects your DNA, okay, that burns down slowly as we get older. And you want to slow that burn down. Okay, who wants to get older? You know, like, well, we do all want to get, we want to age great. And we want to make sure as we're aging, our DNA is not burning down too fast. What are things that happen as we age and our DNA gets shorter? Our hair starts to fall out, starts to turn gray, our skin gets wrinkly, our heart function gets less vibrant and, and powerful as before. So we get, get tend towards heart failure. Our eyesight goes down, you know, our retina, you know, the neuroretina, which receives light transmitted to our brain starts to fade. What's the common denominator 
of aging and all of those cell types is that our telomeres are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Remember that powder keg I was telling you about? When you get down to the powder keg, man, game over, right? You can't run away from that blast far enough. And so basically what you want to do is slow that fuse down. It turns out that sunflower seeds can actually naturally slow down telomere degradation. You know, uh, we're all made out of stem cells. So when our uh, moms got together with our dads and started to create, you know, the, the fetus that we started from and as we grew in the womb, um, the only reason we're around is because our stem cells actually created us. So that's why it's part of your soul because it is, it's you and it's me. We're all made out of stem cells. The thing is that when, we're, when, we're, when we grow up, even as adults, we're, we still have stem cells, some stem cells that are left. So if you take a look at 37 trillion human cells in the adult body, we got about 0.002% small fraction. Actually, the absolute number is pretty big. It's about 74 million okay, of our cells still are stem cells, which means that they're hanging around waiting to actually fix and regenerate our bodies. Listen, when we were kids, we learned from our teachers that starfish and salamanders can regenerate, but people can't, right? That's what we all heard about. But science has turned that around. We now know that people do regenerate from the inside out and with these stem cells that are still left. It does it slowly, but that's what actually helps us heal, uh, heal and injure our, when we're injured and also regenerate parts of ourselves, including our brain. In fact, there was a research um, study just uh, that produced uh, just published just last week that just showed that in fact the adult brain actually still regenerates new neurons so quite amazing what these things do all right part of our defense systems obviously very very important and it turns out that foods can actually um, enhance our stem cells coax them out help us repair ourselves stimulate our own regeneration and there are other foods that can actually damage them and so this is actually another one of our defenses that very sensitive. We got to kind of treat them the right way, and then we can actually um, boost them when, whenever we need to. Yes, yes. And so, as you mentioned, this is the beginning of life. You know, egg, sperm, meat. Then we have this uh, kind of explosion of activity with these stem cells, and these particular stem cells are able to diversify and become anything our bodies need. But as we develop, we start to have less and less of those type of stem cells, and more have more specialized stem cells. But if you could, can you share where do our stem cells as we, you know, grow into adults, where do they hide out and how many do we have left? Because I would think that it's not one of the biggest resources that we have access to. Yeah, they're they're sort of like diamonds hiding in the mountain. Mm -hmm. And most of them are living inside our bone marrow. Right. So, um, you know, our bones are actually hollow. Uh, they're not they're not actually filled with they're not all bone all the way solid through in the middle of a bone marrow are tons of cells including blood cells but mostly stem cells and so those stem cells live in there like bees living in a hive waiting for the time when they're actually needed so on an average day the body re releases a few of these bees these stem cells into the circulation or they're, they're doing conducting surveillance figuring out what needs to be repaired and doing their job if you have an injury though whether it's surgery or trauma uh, if your uh, heart starved of uh, oxygen with clogging, you know, from cholesterol, then more stem cells will come pouring out and they go right to the site of trouble. They're kind of like troubleshooters, right? Um, again, not many. They're like 0.002% of all of our cells are stem cells. So they're the minority of our cells, but they are powerful because as you say, wherever they go, they know how to turn into that tissue or that organ. Oh, that's so amazing. And, you know, if we really think about this, and I've done like a masterclass episode talking about the liver, we can lose like a third, even potentially two thirds of our liver and it's able to regenerate. Like we have this yeah. capacity within us, but we don't think right. about it in terms of like how amazing and how, how good could, could this get potentially if we really understand what stem cells can do in regenerating, like you just mentioned, our, our brains. Or, you know, if somebody does lose a limb, for example. Well, you know that our nerves actually regenerate at two millimeters a day. So you can take it out in a ruler and, you know, if you actually had a problem with your arm, you can actually measure how much nerve you'll grow every single day to regenerate it. So think about what, think about the implication for the spinal cord, right? Yeah, or yeah. after a stroke, I mean, massive implications, but the, and, and, you know, there are lots of biotech companies, uh, Sean, that are developing stem cell therapies where they're taking stem cells and processing them and trying to figure out ways to inject them back in for sickness. 
again, we're back to that old model, which is a worthy one of looking for a sick person and figuring out how to actually inject a bullet back into them to you know, wipe out a disease. I'm all for that. Okay. However, the amazing thing that I write about in my book are the is the science has also shown us that foods can actually help support and coax out our own stem cells. So we don't need to be injected. We can just eat the right things. That's exactly what I want to talk about now. So I would love to talk about some of these foods and nutrients that are capable of, like you said, coaxing out and mobilizing these stem cells so our bodies can potentially be able to do these jobs that we've been talking about. Right. Well, you know, some of the, and this, but this is a relatively new area of research. Uh, I'll tell you the most surprising one first. I think your listeners will like this is actually dark chocolate. Mm. So, you know, who, who needs another reason to like chocolate, but here's one that's really, really informed by science. So we know that really dark chocolates made with cacao. Cacao is a natural substance that comes out of a bean. And inside those cacao beans are polyphenols, right? Really potent polyphenols. And so dark chocolate, which is usually 70% or higher, you can just look at that number on the side of a, the chocolate bar you might find, darker the better, the higher the number, the more potent it actually is, um, actually can uh, help mobilize those stem cells out of our bone marrow. There's a study I write about from UCSF in San Francisco, University of California in San Francisco, where they took patients with coronary disease. These are people that already had heart disease with narrowing of their arteries, and they gave them hot cocoa. So, you know, just like like made with dark chocolate, uh, and super dark chocolate, uh, twice a day, and they had them drink that every day for a month, 30 days. And they looked at their blood from the beginning to the very end, and they found that the only thing they ever did was actually drink this cocoa. That's the only intervention. It doubled the number of stem cells in the same person from beginning to end. And it also improved their circulation, their blood flow. When they measured it using the same kind of tests that we use in a medical clinic or for biotech companies, actually doubled the, the, the activity of their blood flow. So this is quite an amazing story that, you know, even something like chocolate, a small drink, it's only, it was only an eight ounce cup twice a day was powerful enough to do this. But there, and there are other beverages that also can actually mobilize stem cells. I had to keep my brain from popping out of my head right there. That's just nuts. That is incredible. That's so remarkable. Something so simple and it's like super prevalent in our culture, but we you know we're a little bit off, you know. We're thinking in terms of the candy bar, but getting like the real thing, you know, that closer to the the natural state, the cacao, and then all the other things it has as well because it got, again, the food doesn't just do one thing. We also have a great source of magnesium and iron so that can potentially help with anemia and we've got uh, precursors to neurotransmitters and hormones like serotonin and anandamide and tryptophan, all from chocolate. And the stem cell thing, it just it, that's it's just too much. I, I love it. I love it so much. So cool. So we've got the stem cells covered, and we talked about angiogenesis. So let's talk next about, and this one right here is super hot out there in, in the in the world of health and wellness. But here's the thing. I'm going to preface this for you. You say in your book, we are no longer simply human. Let's talk. Tell me what you mean by that. All right. Well, there's a term called holobiont, H-O-L-O-B-I-O-N-T. And that word refers to an organism that's actually made up of smaller organisms or other multiple organisms to function as a whole. And that's what we are. Uh, you know, we all call ourselves humans, but in fact, we're human cells mixed with bacteria cells and those healthy bacteria, which is what we call the microbiome. And by the way, there's 39 trillion of those bacteria living inside our body means that we're kind of an ecosystem. We're a big coral reef. Some of them are human cells and some of them are bacteria cells. And we collaborate uh, in this ecosystem. We make one gigantic neighborhood that gets together. And like any neighborhood, when you've got good people in it, good cells, good bacteria, things work pretty well. You know, everybody's happy. And when you've got some bad players, bad actors, and that can happen in the body as well, you get some bad bacteria in that neighborhood, you wind up having a disrupted ecosystem and you wind up having problems. And a lot, we're beginning to realize that a lot of health problems may actually be tracked back to problems in our bacteria. Our healthy bacteria aren't healthy anymore. So this is the, the new frontier for health, 
starts inside our gut with our bacteria. Mm, so true. And um, one of the things that has been coming forward is uh, the the influence that our microbiome has on our, it's kind of like the big epigenetic influence. And we'll talk more about that in a moment, but knowing that, you know, these microbes have genes as well. And if you take all their number, it potentially has more genes than we do. And we think that we just have this one genetic lot that we've been given. And all of this stuff is so flexible and changeable. And our diet plays a huge role in this. And one of the specific bacteria that you talk about is uh, uh, Ackermansia. Can you talk about this one? Because as far as eating to beat disease and longevity, I think this is one that people are going to be hearing a lot about. Right. So this uh, Ackermansia is a bacteria that only has been discovered in the 90s. So it's really not one of these ancient bacteria that we've known about, you know, uh, since Louis Pasteur kind of thing. Right. Like the, the one of the earlier discoveries of, of microorganisms. Uh, it became important in my work because one of the things that actually has happened in medicine is that we now are beginning to treat cancer patients with something called immunotherapy. Immune therapies um, can actually really re eliminate all cancer in a patient by not killing the cancer directly, but by activating your own immune system and allowing your immune system, which is another one of our defenses, to search and destroy and figure out any of these bad cells that need to go away, right? That's what normally happens. I, I mentioned to you, like, I think we, we're all forming cancers all the time. You don't have angiogenesis. The immune system's got to wipe that out. But when we do have cancer, what we now know is that immune therapies can be given to cancer patients. These are FDA approved or they've changed the way we even think about cancer. You can treat these patients with immune therapies and it activates, lights up the immune system to wipe out, wipe out the patients, uh, pay, wipe out the cancer. Now, some patients don't respond very well to these immune therapies, meaning the cancer doesn't actually shrink, doesn't go away. And it's one of the big mysteries on why. Well, a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine in Paris was speaking at a meeting that we had invited her. I had invited her to. Her name is Dr. Laurence Zipbogo out of Paris. And she's a brilliant immuno immunologist who discovered in people who cancer patients who are getting treated with these immune therapies that the difference between whether they would respond and do well to the treatment or not respond and not do well was one bacteria. And that one bacteria is Ackermansia. Mm. If you had Ackermansia, you did well. Your immune system did, uh, was able to activate. And that just shows you how powerful these, the microbiome is. Like they talks directly and facilitates our immune system. You didn't have it, man, game over. So here's the thing about Ackermansia. You can't eat it as a probiotic, right? So there's no, like you can't go online and order the Ackermansia probiotic. The only way you can grow Ackermansia, Sean, is with food. Mm. Turns out that pomegranate juice can actually... Uh, change the gut in a way that the acromancia love to grow. Acromancia love to grow in the mucus lining of the gut. When you have pomegranate juice, like real pomegranate juice, um, it, it'll actually grow that mucus lining. And within about a month, you can kind of double or triple the amount of acromancia that you need for your immune system. Wow. Wow. That's nuts. Again, just so remarkable. And also acromancia is, is um, correlated with longevity. You know, seeing folks that are living over 100 years having a higher ratio of that as well. That's right. So, you know, we're beginning to just, this is the new biology, right? Like, you know, kids who are actually interested in going into science or medicine, you know, today are going to be learning all this stuff as part of their, you know, fundamentals. And for us, it's like new discoveries. So we're really at this golden age, I think, of discovering about the, the secrets of health. Yes. So let's start to add in some pomegranates out there and also pomegranate juice, but be careful with the kinds that's sweetened with oh, sugar yeah. and things like that. Because added sugar actually injures our microbiome. Yeah. The other thing I, I, you know, I want to mention for your, uh, for your listeners about um, acromancy is that it's pretty vulnerable. You know, like if you take a common antibiotic that we'll uh, use for bronchitis, you know, uh, uh, that everybody gives, um, that'll wipe out the acromancia pretty quickly. Wow. And so this is a bacteria that, you know, we got to grow back. And that's what you keep, you got to keep on top of that. Yeah. And you talk about in the book how um, we, we lose these species and some of them can be very difficult to get back if we can even get them back at all. And especially as our 
um, children, you know, we pass these on our, our microbiome and we start to see complete like, you know, microbiome. If we're thinking about it in terms of being like a rainforest, we've got like some species that might be endangered, some are extinct, and it can be very difficult to get these back. And especially as we go on in our lineage, as we pass on these traits in our microbiome, get passed on to our children and then our grandchildren. And so we need to pay attention to this stuff right now and be a little bit more judicious in our use of antibiotics. They can absolutely be life-saving, but in some instances, we do not need them and we can do some other things instead. And this is why we need to be more conscious as we're working alongside our physicians and our instructors, health coaches, things like that. And so I would imagine that ferments would be something important to, to, to add in, maybe even something like kimchi. Well, it's amazing to know that kimchi is made with fermented, is fermented and is rich with bacteria. And it's been known for more than 20 years that people that eat kimchi actually have a stronger immune system. We're feeding back, we're putting bacteria in them. And in fact, kimchi itself has its own unique kimchi type of bacteria. And it's been shown to actually fight the flu. But kimchi isn't the only thing. You know, some people love kimchi. I love kimchi, but not everybody likes it. So how about sauerkraut? right? Flip to the other side of the world and you actually have pickled, you know, cabbage and that actually contains uh, back healthy bacteria as well. Keep going back. Now you go to Asia and there's something called pao chai, which actually you find like in the Chinese restaurant, they'll put a little bit of these pickled vegetables at the beginning of a meal, also made with fermented uh, bacteria. And, you know, what's also interesting is that there's, we're discovering that even bread and cheese, which are made with bacteria, can be helpful. In fact, I like to talk about, you know, there's this whole anti-carb thing out there, but as you pointed out yourself, it's not all or nothing with one thing. Foods are complicated, and a, a one bread that's really interesting is pumpernickel bread. You know that brown bread? Uh, it's made with rye flour, and the rye flour actually lowers a harmful bacteria that grows in the gut that actually releases a toxin that causes inflammation. And so by eating rye flour bread, you can actually lower that bacteria and lower inflammation. On the other hand, sourdough bread, you know, some people really love sourdough bread, is made with a bacteria called lactobacillus ruteri. Now, lactobacillus, you know, the lactic acid, acid is actually what makes the sourdough bread tangy. That's, what, that's a good part of the bread. That bacteria is normally found in the gut, our healthy gut, and it boosts our immune system helps us do healing, and it actually communicates to our brain and prompts our brain to release the hormone, the social hormone oxytocin, which is mm. the feel-good hormone we get when we get a hug from somebody we love. Mm. I love this so much because we're getting the a whole story, you know. I haven't heard Pumpernickel said in so long. When I hear it, I think of, that's like something in a Disney movie, right? That's the kind of, that's, a, that's the bread a fairy would eat, right? Pumpernickel. And then we've got the sourdough as well and understanding we've got like a uh, this kind of fermented capacity to it and the ability to literally produce more oxytocin. But being mindful, you know, for some folks, that's not going to resonate with you. And for other folks, this can be a potentially healing food for you. So, again, just keeping our minds open and looking at the, the research and also testing things out, because one of the things you also encourage is for folks to try things and 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 go for the things that they enjoy because you're giving them permission to eat the foods and some of the beverages that they enjoy as well but just doing this a little bit more intelligently right now my emphasis is on what you should add to your diet yeah. not what you should eliminate or take away because you know listen human nature abhors deprivation you know how many times have you heard it said if you can't do something your mind automatically says well maybe i should want to do it but on the other hand, also these deprivation diets are really difficult to stick to. And what we need to do is think about patterns that actually we can stick to our whole lives from the time we were kids to, you know, to, to, you know, to when we're really old. Uh, we ought to be able to actually stick to something that we love. And so in my book, I show more than 200 foods. Look through those foods, circle the ones you already like, and choose those next time you're going out to go shopping or ordering from a restaurant because then you're already ahead of the game because mm. you're picking the things you already love. Love it, love it, love it. One more thing I want to ask you about before we move on from the microbiome is the importance of, it's something that the microbiome does for us that we don't really talk a lot about, and this is producing these short-chain fatty acids. So can you please just give people some a little bit of information on that? Right. So um, bacteria in our gut uh, don't just sit there. 
they're pretty active and but they're also eating things and feeding themselves. So think about like, you know, uh, your goldfish in an aquarium, right? You drop some uh, flakes in there and they drop, go down into the goldfish and the goldfish eat them up and you see all these little particles that come out of the fish's mouth. Anybody's had a fish bowl will, will remember that. Well, that's exactly what the microbiome does. So when we feed them fiber, for example, soluble fiber, we're feeding the bacteria, the bacteria are eating these fibers and they're creating little particles, little fragments um, from the fiber. And, and some of these fragments are called short chain fatty acids acids or scaphas, but they are not just crumbs that drop to the bottom of the aquarium. In fact, they actually dissolve right out of the gut, get into our bloodstream. And again, Mother Nature being very resourceful has figured out these short chain fatty acids. What the bacteria cut up those that fiber into actually can have a function. So it's um, anti-inflammatory. It's immune boosting. It actually can be pro-angiogenic as well, as well as anti-angiogenic. There's different types and different sizes of these fragments. And so they're, they're kind of invisible, but the bacteria know exactly how to make them. Awesome, awesome. So of these five defense systems, we've talked about angiogenesis, we've talked about regeneration via stem cells, the microbiome. Next up, you talk about DNA protection. Right, so who hasn't heard about DNA, right? Ancestry.com, 23andMe, take a cheek swab, figure out who you're related to or what you you know what kind of risk you have. All very important, right? The human genome, when we actually... Uh, uh, sequence the human genome. That was like a milestone in human history. We finally sort of hat into our genetics, they say. Well, here's the other thing. Like, you know, we're always trying to be smart, uh, you know, as scientists to figure out what's going on. But in fact, you know, Mother Nature and evolution is a lot smarter than we could ever be. And the DNA is not just the genetic code that makes proteins in our body, but in fact, it actually protects us against the environment. What do I mean by that? Well, look, anybody who's ever sat in traffic for a long time, you know, with the on a sunny day, you're getting sunshine pouring in through your windows. Or if you're at, out at the beach, you know, and you're not wearing enough sunscreen, you get ultraviolet radiation, DNA damage, mutating your skin. Anybody who's ever smelled secondhand smoke, I mean, I hope people don't smoke, but if they don't smoke, even if you smell it from somebody else, that's DNA damage. That, that Just smelling that will damage your DNA in your lungs. Or how many people fill up their car at the filling station, right? Do you stand upwind or downwind uh, of, of, the, of the, uh, the hose? If you can smell that fuel, DNA damage. The good news is that your body, the DNA, it knows how to protect itself. So it fixes itself, rebuilds itself, it caps itself off with the telomeres. It does a lot of things to protect itself. You call it an epigenetics. These are all mechanisms that really help us maintain our functionality of our DNA. And the great news is that foods can actually influence that process. Let's talk about some foods that can do that. Well, one of the foods that you talked about earlier, turmeric, is actually a great DNA modifier. So basically, turmeric can uncloak DNA that is useful and even fight even cancer fighting DNA to unleash the protective DNA to help fight cancer. And it can also cap some of the DNA that you know might actually not be so helpful as well. And so that's one example of a spice that we can add to our food. Oh yeah, don't forget to add it with fresh cracked black pepper if you're actually using it for, for cooking. Um, but th those two ingredients are really important together. But I wanna tell you some things that are like not as well known, um, like for example, kiwi fruit, right? Everybody who's seen a kiwi, it's like this monkey ball shaped thing, furry, cut it down the middle, open it up. It's got this bright green um, uh, flesh, really juicy and sweet. It's packed with vitamin C and other vitamins. And there have been studies in humans, clinical studies, in which they've actually taken young people and measured their blood at the beginning and looked at their DNA, how well it does, how well it can protect itself. And then they gave them one kiwi. And they, and they ate them, and they measured after a couple of days that eating that one kiwi can protect their DNA, increase it by 60%. So you can just eat one kiwi a day, and it pops up your defense mechanisms. If you eat three kiwis a day, it helps your DNA rebuild itself. So it actually repairs itself. So, you know, here's a simple, lowly kiwi fruit, you know, like I'll, I might have one for breakfast, for example, that can actually do a lot for you. Wow. And shout out to New Zealand where kiwis originated and uh we got some great listeners there as well when you said monkey ball looking thing i was like what i almost laughed out loud it's like the doctor's monkey ball looking thing um so 
Kiwis, there's something for us to add in, protecting our DNA. But I would love if you talk about a little bit about the telomeres. You know, this is something that I've highlighted several times on the show, but now we've got even more data. And it's really, it's, it's remarkable because I, this might be the best biological marker we have for how long we're going to live potentially. And our lifestyle, food choices can affect our telomeres, whether they get shortened or whether we can activate telomerase and potentially grow some back. Right. So think about your DNA like like yarn. Uh, that's like a big string, a big lump, a big pile of yarn. You're going to wind that yarn up, right? So you wind it around something, and that's really what our chromosomes are. Our DNA is wound up into these X's and Y's that are packed inside our cells. That's really our genome packed into chromosomes. And at the very end, you can imagine if you're winding up a ball of yarn, you got to be able to get that, that yarn to so it doesn't unravel to stick. And so you got to put a cap on it. The cap is the telomere. Uh, you know, physically, it kind of looks like the plastic tip on the end of a shoelace, kind of protects it and holds the thing to prevent it from unraveling. That protective cap on our DNA is part of our protection. Longer the telomere, longer we think we're going to live. Cellular aging. Shorter the telomere, the, sh the shorter these cells are going to live. And so one of the big areas of research right now, by the way, this research led to the Nobel Prize uh, a few years ago, is what can we actually do to lengthen our telomere? So for those people that are, you know, sort of the Ponce de Leon people looking for the fountain of youth, everybody's looking for things that actually keep our telomeres longer. Well, the answers are from research that I write about in my book might actually be in already in our kitchens. Mm. So, for example, coffee turns out to be a beverage that actually can not just prevent our telomeres from burning down like a fuse, it actually can lengthen the telomeres as well. So that's really quite an amazing thing that coffee can actually uh, uh, do that. But actually, it's probably more dietary pattern. You know, uh, I mean, and, and people that have good dietary patterns tend to be generally healthier. They tend to exercise and sleep better and all that kind of stuff. But the Mediterranean diet is one of the best examples of a whole food, plant, primarily plant-based diet with healthy oils, um, uh, seafood, and relatively low uh, red meat and minimal processed foods. That combination tends to lengthen telomeres. And so that's really one of the amazing things. You know, I have a colleague, Dr. Dean Ornish. He and I worked together on looking at sort of um, healthy patterns of diets. And we actually found, in fact, that um, healthy diets like the Mediterranean diets not only actually lengthen telomeres, but also at the same time, again, being Mother Nature being very efficient, actually are also anti-angiogenic that can protect you against uh, cancer. So something that's good for the goose is probably good for the gander. Yes, absolutely. And by the way, everybody, when he talked about that end cap on a shoe, shoelace, I was doing a talk for high school students, and this was maybe eight years ago. And one of the students, and we we're talking about telomeres, you know, it was like a science conference thing. And one of the students was like, those are called aglets. And I was like, what? what? Is that real? Is that true? It has a name? And they're actually called aglets. So telomeres are like aglets, and we all know what it's like when we don't have those on the end of our shoestrings, and they get frayed. It is like the worst thing. You like try to put some spit on it and twist it up. It try, it's just terrible. But you don't want your DNA to unravel like that, you know. So, thank you for sharing that. It's such such a powerful thing, and we're just learning so much more about this. And I, I didn't know about this coffee thing. That's super remarkable. And big shout out to folks who are, you know. Going for the good stuff, all right? We're not getting the Nick Cafe. We're getting some good, organic, high-quality coffee and can do a lot of benefit for you. So we've covered four of the five defense systems, and there's one more, and I don't think any more is more important than this one as well. So let's talk about the immune system. Right. So every grandmother's told their grandkids that you got to protect your immune system, right? If you don't have a good immune system, you're going to get sick. So we know that the immune system protects us against infection, but we now know that the immune system also protects us against cancer and other serious diseases as well, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So what are some of the things that can activate the immune system besides drugs? I mean, there's a lot of things that can actually help our immune system, but food, you know, is really a pretty powerful way to enhance it. We talked a little bit about earlier about kimchi boosting our immune system through the microbiome, but there are foods that just can actually automatically boost our immune system by themselves. Mm. One of them is mango. 
You know, I love mangoes. They're juicy, sweet, filled with fiber. They got lots of vitamins, and they also have bioactives. and And I call a mango, by the way, a um, stone fruit. Well, mango is a stone fruit, but I call mangoes and stone fruit grand slammers of foods. These are foods, a whole table of foods I have in my um, in my uh, book that all activate all five. Uh, defense systems at the same time, including the immune system. So you can slam it out of the park by eating these foods. Mango is one of my favorites. Tasty, juicy, sweet. You get vitamins, good minerals, and it actually contains these natural bioactives that actually can help boost your immune system. And it's happening to a degree, in fact, that's unprecedented because not only do the drug company, they fund the study, but they find the people to do the study and increasingly, when you read the medical literature, they're actually the ones writing the study in, 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 in the journal. So the whole thing is basically they're tilting the field as far as they can towards showing that this drug is effective when it may or may not be effective. And unfortunately, sort of like 80, 90 percent of the drugs are not much more effective than the old drug um, that's available, but they cost sort of like 10 or 20 times more. So that's that's the sad part about it. Uh, it's a lot of people gaming the system to to get to get you know to get sales and uh, it's obviously worked for them. And now there's a new model as well that just came into existence pretty recently which is the FDA itself being funded by money coming from pharmaceutical companies itself. I think somewhere around the ballpark of like 40% of their income is coming from pharmaceutical companies. So saying being able to literally write your own checks, write your own approval, like it's just getting deeper and deeper. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful for this conversation because literally millions of people, they invest sometimes everything that they've got to try to save their loved ones. All the money they've got, they pull out, you know, put a second mortgage on their home, they do whatever it takes to try to save their lives with oftentimes drugs that are framed to be this potential life-saving thing and more often than not it's not even anywhere close to that and you mentioned this earlier and this is what i want to point back to drug costs are the single largest cause of personal bankruptcy in the united states like people really don't get that people are literally betting the farm trying to save the lives of their loved ones and themselves so let's talk a little bit about the rising prices of cancer medications because this is one of the biggest areas you mentioned one that actually had really great effectiveness. Uh, imatinib, you mentioned that a little bit earlier. And the cost to the manufacturer to make, this is highlighted in your book. The cost of the manufacturer to make is estimated to be about $216 a year. The cost to the customer to get that drug is about $120,000 per year. Yeah. How, how is that possible? <laughs> Well, I think that what happened was that um, the drug, when it came out, was not even that expensive. Right. It was a few thousand dollars. And when they priced it in 2000, rough in the early 2000s, they thought it was ridiculous. It was very high priced for the time, but like sort of like a tenth of the cost of what it costs today, sort of like a few thousand dollars a year, not like a few hundred thousand dollars a year. But over that time, so this is the same drug. It just, they kept raising the prices. And because it was so effective, they, it didn't matter how much it cost to make, it only mattered how much people were willing to pay for it. They kept raising the price. It was something like 5% over inflation. So even though it's the same drug, the prices just kept going up and up and up. And it's not like it's a new drug. Like there's no new anything. It's the same manufacturing process. It's your same factory that's making it. And as competitors came on board, they didn't lower the price because this is usually what happens when you have generic uh, drugs. So you say you have one drug and another, and you know, if the patent expires, another drug company comes in and they say, well, I'm going to cut the cost in half. That's how I'm going to compete at a lower cost. But the new manufacturers, when the patent ran out and made a new sort of second generation, they didn't lower the price. They raised the price. So, and so basically they're colluding to raise prices because they know that they could raise, drop the price. They could drop the price like, you know, by a hundred fold, it'd still make a huge profit. But by colluding together, 
they would actually make a lot more money. As rank, remember, baseball had that collusion thing a long time ago where they're basically trying to screw the players. This is the same thing. The drug company is basically colluding to raise prices. So they have this understanding that they keep the prices high. Therefore, the consumer, which is us as the public, we have no choice because you go with manufacturer A or B or C, they are all really high priced. They're all a few hundred thousand dollars. So you have you're you're screwed no matter where you go. And all of them are just making money. So if if one of them dropped the price, of course, if one of them falls out of collusion, then the bottom would drop out of the market. But nobody has any incentive to do that. So the prices kept going up and up and up and far in excess of what normal, you know, inflation was. I always think back on that show. Remember Breaking Bad? This is such a great show, right? I mean, the whole reason he started selling crack or crystal meth was cancer costs. Mm. Even at, you know, I don't know when this, uh, when did it come out? 2010, something like that. Even in the 2010s when that, that show came out, the drug costs were already so ridiculous that it was reasonable for a high school teacher to sell crystal meth <laughs> to fund yeah. his, his cancer medicines, right? It's crazy. It was already believable right. at that time. And it's not gotten better, right? And unless people know about it and start to make noise about it, it's, it's, it's going to keep happening. It's collusion. Like this whole idea of drug companies funding studies to make their own drugs look better, raising costs, passing costs off. Uh, you have all this, all this um, conflicts of interest, not only within the industry, but like, you know, like you said with the FDA, but also um, researchers, for example, when they, you know, leave research, often they go to a drug company. So, they know that there's a hugely lucrative job waiting for them as long as, you know, if you're a university professor, you don't want to rock the boat because you might be going to work for that guy, you know, in a couple of years for a couple million bucks. So why would you go come down on the drug company and say, oh, you're such, a, you know, this is the wrong thing. And I always say, I, I didn't mention this in the book, but it's like, it's, it's such a screwed up practice really where drug companies are really allowed to pay doctors and researchers whatever they want. Like there's a huge conflict of interest because it's like, you can't pay a policeman. Like if a company tried to pay a judge or a policeman or even a newspaper uh, journalist, everybody would be like, you can't do that. You can't just pay people. But the drug company can pay the researcher however much they want. And it's usually in the six and seven figures. So now you have this whole group of doctors and researchers and stuff. And I, 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 you know, I know because I'm sort of, I'm not on the inside of academics, but I'm in medicine. I see it all the time. Like you have these people getting huge payouts. You have doctors getting free meals and free this and free that. Um, and you know, why would we allow that? Like as, as the public, like why, 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 why wouldn't you just say, you know what? I don't think drug companies should be funding studies on their own drugs. Like, why would it you allow that? It just sounds <laughs> obvious. It sounds obvious. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, there are, and there's laws against these things. There's laws against collusion and price gouging, but it seems to not apply here for some reason, for some strange <laughs> for reason, some this reason. is acceptable yeah. unless it's, it takes so much for these things to come to light and it is it's it's in the minority it's a it's a very rare occasion when it would happen and so it, it hasn't gotten better it's continued to get worse and it's becoming and i think that a big part of it is that we've come to accept it as normal you know the the public just doesn't kind yeah. of uh it just it's in the background just like yeah that's going on what can we do about it and not understanding that we're really yeah. steamrolling this situation to where again Drug costs are the single largest cause of personal bankruptcy. And it's not it's not OK. This is not about saving lives. Like if we've got a medication that can actually save lives and this was something that was altruistic, you know, of course, we want people to make a profit, but it's not about that. This is literally creating a situation where we're taking advantage of the public in a in a hideous way. Oh, yeah, it's it's it, and, and, and in a way that is sort of unique, that is not available to other 
industries, like it, we, we don't accept it in almost any other industry, um, but we accept it in medicine. And it's like, why? But, you know, when, when you have bad medicines that cost too much, it affects every single person in this country. So why allow that? That's what I don't uh, understand sometimes is why we allow that. And, um, you know, and maybe it's because it, you have to think about these problems a little bit and, you know, uh, you know, it's it, it sort of hidden a little bit because you get into this state where you say, oh, this is a breakthrough. This is a breakthrough. And, and I did talk about this, but there's been so many breakthroughs uh, proclaimed in the newspapers about cancer. And yet cancer just kind of goes right along. Like there's no breakthroughs going on. It's just the perception. Right. It's a fake through progress. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> so the, well, this, it's, it's, this is the part about your book that is the most, the most affirmative and, and really enlightening, which is we don't have to participate so heavily in, in that universe. You know, again, there are some effective medications that have been discovered, but we're talking about a tiny, tiny percentage. For the most part, it's understanding yeah. more so what are the causative agents here behind cancer? And let's operate at that level where it's actually effective. And you give this great analogy that I think it's just really a game changer of the seed and the soil. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the seed is really uh, about the sort of the genetic changes and how the evolution is playing a role in changing the causing these gene mutations. But there's actually a lot more to it than that. And it gets hidden by this genetic paradigm that it's sort of this genetic lottery system. But it's not because if you think about a seed, you can have the same seed. You plant it in soil, it grows. You plant it in the desert, it doesn't grow. Same seed different soil. So clearly the environment plays a huge role. And what we've lost sight of by looking so closely at the seed, which is the genes, the gene mutations, the evolution of it, is we forget that there are populations in the world that have virtually no cancer. So if you look at the old writings of missionary physicians and stuff, what they find is that when you look at traditional societies that are eating a traditional diet and following a traditional lifestyle, so they looked at places in Africa, for example, and compared that to the Europeans, they looked at the Inui in the far north, and they find that there's almost no cancer. In fact, Queen's University in Ontario used to send an Arctic expedition up every year to see why these people are immune to cancer. As they became sort of, uh, you know, more uh, westernized, that is eating bread and sugar and Cheetos. so on, as they, yeah, <laughs> as they sort of came into, away from their traditional foods, away from their traditional lifestyle, turns out they weren't immune at all. They got the same cancers as the rest of us. And same within Africa. So in Africa, these missionary physicians would go and they, what they'd notice is that the white Europeans would get colon cancer the Africans, following their own diet and traditional lifestyle, almost never did. As those Africans became westernized and started following sort of a Western diet, they got cancer. So they, in fact, called it one of the diseases of civilization. Not a great term, obviously, but that's what they called it. This was back in the 60s. So clearly what they found was that there's a huge environmental component. Where you live has a huge bearing and the foods you eat has a huge bearing. If you take a more recent example, you can look at Japan, which is a very sort of modern nation, and you can look at America, and the rates of cancer are strikingly different. So you can't say that one is civilized and one isn't because both are civilized. But you move a Japan, a Japanese person to America and the risk of cancer goes up way up. The risk of prostate cancer goes up, the risk of breast cancer goes up. So it wasn't about the genetics because it's the same Japanese genetics that moved over. It was something to do with our diet. And that was huge because if you go back to that, what we talked about earlier, which is that the, the, the sort of attributable risk, tobacco was at 30%, but diet was right behind it at 30%. So what we need to know is not more about the genetics, of cancer. What we need to know is what is it about our diet 
that is making us get cancer because that's the important thing that we can actually do something about. And it turns out that there's been a huge amount of, of research in the last 20 years which has looked at the this exact question. And it turns out that obesity is probably one of the major risk factors. Type 2 diabetes, again, one of the major risk factors. And uh, it comes down probably to the high insulin levels. Insulin, we think of it as a metabolic agent that is, you know, you give it when you have type 1 diabetes. Insulin is a, is a hormone that goes up when you eat a lot of refined carbohydrates, for example. Insulin spikes way up. Turns out that it's a nutrient sensor. That is, it tells the body that nutrients are coming in, but it's a very highly potent growth factor. So if you put the seed, which is that sort of cancerous seed, in the soil that is promoting, highly promoting growth, you are going to get the growth of those cancerous seeds. If you take that cancerous seed and you put it in a soil where there's very low insulin, like there's just nothing to grow with, there's no growth factors, because that's the soil, that's the good soil is with lots of growth factors. If you put it in a, in a body that has no growth factors, it's gonna have a lot more trouble growing, and your own intrinsic anti-cancer defenses will be able to take care of it. And that's the whole point. We have to understand not only about the seed, but we've looked at the seed for so long. We have to understand the soil. And that's where obesity, type 2 diabetes is such a huge, 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 huge risk factor and something that is actually completely within our control. This is so remarkable because, so you just mentioned this with, if we're talking about the seed, we're really talking about the fact that, you know, Number one, these genetic mutations being the seed of cancer, the seed of cancer is really, we, we, I think we have a tendency to think that it's relegated to certain cells. We have the seed of cancer in every cell of our body. And that, that's the big yeah. thing to, to, to kind of like as a paradigm shift, like the seed is there in every cell of our body. And it's not just uniquely human. This is across different species as well. The seed is there for cancer, for mutations, but the environment, the conditions are what, and, and so much of our paradigm has been focused on the seeds of cancer, while the soil and the conditions yeah. have largely been ignored. And you bringing up uh, this issue around insulin, for example, and being a very po powerful growth agent, this brings to, to light something, I, I've gotta ask you about this, this is so, so interesting. And one of the big drivers we think about with diabetes and obesity is sugar and a big driver of insulin activity. And the connection between sugar and cancer, funny enough, is commonly debunked, quote, debunked. But some of the most, and this is some of the most prestigious organizations claim that there's no connection, but there is, and it's not hard to find. Just talk about a, a PET scan, for example. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, so glucose is uh, the, the sugar that we use. And a PET scan uh, detects cancer by detecting how much uh, a cell takes up that glucose. So cancer cells take up that glucose, which is sugar, far more rapidly than any other cell around it. So it lights up like a, you know, like a candle. It's like just a, this big blob um, because you use radioactive labeled glucose and you see where, what cells are taking up that glucose. So you know that the cells love this stuff. <laughs> it's just going to town on that glucose. So you know the cancers are feeding themselves with that glucose, and yet people are saying, well, it makes no difference if you know you eat you know, sugar, which causes insulin resistance, which causes high insulin levels, and so on. And you know, it's, it's one of these things where I find it very strange, because you know, it's, it's, it, there's a clear, sort of pathophysiology like the the science is is there it's not like it's completely oh you know ufos did it sort of thing right, right? it's but like don't bring that you up know, it's not something so dr fung don't bring up the <laughs> ufos right now at this time all of you know we're seeing all of these different things it might be aliens but anyways go ahead i'm sorry there might be aliens. <laughs> yeah they're right with all the new uh the new uh, navy uh <laughs> pictures but you know what I mean, right? It's not that this, this random thing that somebody said. It's like there's clear evidence that there's something in our diet 
that has changed from traditional society to modern society that influences cancer rates. Sugar is one of the most common things that as you go from a traditional society, um, you know, traditional diets are very low in sugar. Um, and, and again, it's hard to compare, say, an Inuit diet where they're eating whale blubber and so on. But you can look at the Chinese diet of the 80s, for example, or the Japanese diet. They're very low in sugar, uh, amongst other things. So there's other things that are obviously different about their diet and our diet. But sugar is a very conspicuous one because the Western diet is typically much higher in sugar than those other traditional diets. The Chinese people, of course, in the 80s and 90s had extremely low levels of sugar, but they've been westernizing uh, very quickly. You look at places like Shanghai and stuff, they're huge metropolises now, and their sugar consumption has gone way up too. And unfortunately, diabetes has gone way up. So they went from sort of a 1% rate of type two, uh, of diabetes overall to like 10, 11%. They're actually higher than the United States, which is scary because they have a huge number of people. So it was clearly not genetics because they, they changed within the space of a generation from the 80s to the 2020, that's one generation. And your rate of type two diabetes went up sort of like tenfold, right? That's a thousand percent it went up. So clearly it's not a genetic thing. It's a dietary thing. And we know that if you have type 2 diabetes, if you have obesity, which also is mushrooming in, in China, um, then your risk of cancer goes way up. In fact, there's 13 different types of cancer that the World Health Organization has deemed obesity-associated cancers. And these are some of the most important cancers that we have, breast cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer. Like other than lung cancer, which actually has nothing to do with obesity, it's all about smoking. Um, those other cancers are like the most important cancers that we have. So, and they're all obesity related. All the top scientists say they're all obesity related. So if they're obesity related, then sugar is going to play a key role because everybody knows eat a lot of sugar, you're more likely to gain weight. If you're more likely to gain weight, you're more, more likely to have type 2 diabetes. So it's like, I don't know why people even argue this kind of thing. The effects are going to take decades. Cancer doesn't develop in a year. So, you know, people do these studies and it's like, oh, we did a year long study and we didn't see any increased risk of cancer. <laughs> it's like, well, that's because your time scale is all wrong. Right. <laughs> it's like saying, you know, you know, we, we, we've determined that uh, if you put metal in water, it doesn't rust because we put metal in water and four days later, it didn't rust. So we've proved it. Like, no, your time scale's all wrong. Cancer takes decades and decades to develop. So you can't see the effect right away. You can see the effect sort of on sugar consumption, for example, and obesity. We see that link very clearly. So now there's a link between obesity and these other obesity-related cancers. So therefore, the link between sugar and cancer is not really a big stretch of the imagination. Like they're two very clearly related things. So why people bother arguing, I just don't understand. It's crazy, like you just said. I think that that's a great understanding is that when we're looking at this in this very short-sighted perspective with sugar, for example, and not understanding, it's kind of like a bamboo tree's growth. Like there's so much happening, festering kind of below the surface before boom, you see this big manifestation. Like with cancer, for example, now we can identify it, but it's often many years in the making when we can actually identify it. And sugar is really still, it's, it's in the same domain as like asbestos right now, where it's taken all of this time and all of these years for it to be acknowledged as dangerous yeah. and the thing is it's like it's the shift that's taken place in our culture just like asbestos it's there was this shift and we've identified that it led to this over a million percent increase in mesothelioma for example but with with sugar in this context for folks to understand here in our culture on average depending on which database you look at we're talking about the average american consuming 70 to 130 pounds of added sugars a year. That's added sugars. It's not even yeah. the naturally occurring sugars in all of the different products and bread products and you know grains and all those things. 
It is an insane amount of sugar that our genes, if we're talking about genetic mutations, have never associated before with before throughout our evolution. And so again, we're having these really strange conversations about it when something is so, so blatantly obvious. But as you mentioned, and I love this about your book so much, you go through and you acknowledge repeatedly how science like this, it takes so long. You basically have to prove, instead of you just already kind of coming into it, like prove that sugar doesn't cause cancer. You know, <laughs> that's which that should be where the work is at. You know, it's very yeah. twisted. So, you know, I think if you could add a little bit more just for folks to kind of to, to wrap up today and wrap up these uh, insights, and just to provide a little bit more empowerment. We know that obesity is obviously a major, major component. You did some really great work putting some data together in the book, connecting uh, obesity and cancer, very, very eye-opening. But what's, what are some of the other things that we can do to help to kind of modulate and create soil that is not conducive to cancer growth? Yeah, I think that this is where the big opportunity for research lies, because there's actually not a lot of research with it. So I talk very briefly about chemo prevention, which is a term that was used sort of in the, you know, starting in the 80s. And it's this idea that you can take something to prevent cancer. The, the truth is that after all these years, there's almost nothing that, and, and people have tried, like if I take this vitamin or this vitamin or this vitamin, maybe I'll prevent cancer. In fact, almost nothing does. So maybe in type two diabetics, this drug called metformin might, and maybe green tea might. Like there's some data coming out of Japan where they drink a lot of green tea, where they say it prevents cancer. So that might be a chemo preventative agent, but it's iffy. The rest of it, all the vitamins, all the other natural supplements and this and that, there's actually no data whatsoever. But what's much more important is not what you're sort of eating, it's sort of what you're not eating, right? It's not that you need to eat more to prevent cancer. It's you need, to, you need to eat less. And certain things are worse for you than others. You, you know, eating less sugar is a big one. Eating less refined food, eating less uh, refined grains, because those are the foods. And we know this for sure. If you eat refined grains, like muffins, like which is made out of flour with a lot of sugar and, uh, you know, other stuff, it's going to spike your insulin levels because of just the way it's made. So if you spike insulin levels and insulin is a growth factor, well, that's going to, you know, anything that promotes growth is going to be pro-cancer as well. So therefore, you want to avoid some of these things such as the, you know, the sugar, the refined grains. And that's just based on sort of knowledge because if you can prevent obesity, and we know that if you eat a lot of sort of white bread and sugar, you're more likely to gain weight. I mean, that's sort of, most people have acknowledged that. Um, and the other thing that's very interesting is this sort of ancient practice of fasting, because again, here's a practice which has been around for thousands of years. And what it does, of course, is it lowers all your sort of um, growth factors, because you, when you don't eat, your nutrient sensors, which is insulin, and also this molecule called mTOR, they're going to go down because you're not eating anything. So no, no, no nutrients are coming in, which sends the signal to the body that do not grow because your body doesn't want to grow if there's no nutrients coming in. If you are sending this message to the body that says do not grow, that is going to be a soil that is not conducive to the growth of cancerous cells. And cancer grows faster than anything else. So the point is that you can actually do these things, such as eating sort of unrefined foods, uh, fasting, and these are the same things that you see in a lot of traditional societies, as well as a lot of the societies that are, you know, have have low rates of cancer, like the sort of 1980s China and 1980s Japan and so on, where they're eating a lot less of things, but they're also incorporating these ideas of fasting. Like they're not like people don't think you're crazy. Like it's 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 just part of what you do over there. Um, you know, and people here used to talk about it too, like it's a cleanse, it's a detox. So it's not that, you know, we have it all wrong because we have this idea that we want to take something to prevent cancer when in fact you, you need to eliminate something 
to prevent cancer. And that's the more effective way to go. And it doesn't cost you any money because, of course, you don't have to buy whatever supplement they're selling. It's actually free. So these ideas of eating unrefined foods, cutting down the sugars and fasting are probably the most important things if you want to do something about your risk of cancer today. And if you are able to lose weight, if you are able to reverse that type 2 diabetes, we know that obesity and type 2 diabetes are going to increase your risk of obesity-related cancers. So if you move yourself away from there by low-carb diets, by you know, eating unrefined foods, by fasting, you're very likely going to lower your risk of cancer. I don't know that for sure because the studies aren't done, but the problem is the, the time scale of those studies, that would take like a 15, 20 year study to do. By that time, you know, it's, you know, you can't implement it because that's so much later. You, but you can implement it today because those are all parts of what we've done traditionally. So I think those are great things to do to lower your own risk of cancer for these uh, things and it all comes back to not the uh, sort of genetics of it, but the sort of environment, the sort of the soil part of things. That's what we need to focus on because that's what we can do something about right now. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here to up level your health today. And teaching people that environmental toxins are present in their home, in their food, in their water but also empower them with other options. What can we do to reduce this, what I call toxic load?